I'm Mark Hamrick and welcome to On The Money. So excited of our segment today because we're going to talk about the financial world, the stock market, and a booming area of investments, exchange-traded funds. And my special guest today is one that I've had the good fortune of knowing for many, many years, Tom Lydon. Tom, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Mark. I've been excited about this. Tom, uh, one thing I, I love about your story is that uh, as some people like to be diversified in their investments, you've been so well diversified in your many pursuits over these many years. But I think one of the most exciting things about your story is the fact that you went from uh, really focused on global investments, essentially, uh, beginning work with Fidelity, uh, then started your own firm, and then you migrated and, and really caught a wave there in Southern California that ended up being a global wave that's exchange-traded funds. I want to know, first of all, let's go way back. Were you always interested in money and, and, and the world of, of finance? Well, it, it's funny, and I wasn't expecting this question, but my dad in the late 60s was a stockbroker and he came in right at the absolute top of the market. And as you know, you kind of live and die by the sword. He went through two years of a bear market, starting out as a stockbroker, and it, and it was devastating. And he ended up jumping ship and going into the real estate market right at the top of the market. Ultimately, when I uh, graduated from Babson, I majored in marketing, but I ended up going into finance with Fidelity. One of my clients wrote a investment newsletter uh, about trends, about long-term trends like 200-day moving averages. And I loved it because if you follow trend following, you're never going to get in at the bottom and out at the top, but you can avoid the long-term major pitfalls in the markets. I I worked for them for a while and then started my own advisory firm in the mid 90s with the idea, Global Trends Investments was the name of the company. I always wanted to be in there for that middle chunk on the upside and try to avoid that middle chunk on the downside. And with that, it just avoids a big chunk of that pain. So fast forward to today, how did I get in the ETF space? In the late 1990s, it was a boom market for mutual funds. ETFs had started in 1993, but had virtually no money invested. When you were managing money, the fund companies were very open to you buying for your clients. However, when the trend line says to vamanos and get out, um, they weren't excited about you selling. But I started to learn that exchange traded funds were available to represent certain areas of the marketplace in an index form. And guess what? You didn't have to make, ask permission to get in and you didn't have to ask permission to get out. So in the early 2000s, I started shifting client assets from mutual funds to ETFs. And then one day put up a little bit of blog about it, started writing about it. And that's what got us to where we are today. And so that brand, that product, that business you have now is ETF Trends. Tell us about what that is. Sure. Um, so it is a website specifically about ETF education, mostly directed towards financial advisors. Uh, there's a lot to write about in the ETF space just because there's a lot to write about in the market. We'll put together 25 or 30 stories uh, a, a day, actually. Uh, we have a lot of the top ETF issuers that we help with their content through video, through uh, webcasts. And three years ago, we actually brought our company together with ETF Database, which is the mo most popular ETF site out there for research. So if you research anything about lists of emerging market ETFs or a specific ticker symbol on an ETF, you're probably going to land on ETF Database. And the traffic between our two sites have gone up over 500% just in the last couple of years because of the popularity of the ETF marketplace, but also more and more investors are doing research online. So uh, fortunately, during this COVID experience, people have spent more time in their portfolio and we've helped them out a little bit. You only can stream Netflix so long, right? <laughs> right, exactly. But, but I appreciate I appreciate that 
thought and that uh, highlight because one of the things we talk about a bank rate is that you know so many people do spend time thinking about where they're going to go now that we can past the pandemic, it seems, where they're going to go to dinner this weekend, right? Or, or what they're going to cook for dinner. And they may not spend as much time researching things that are ultimately more important and more lasting. And that is things that have to do with their personal finance. And so you're very much about helping people across the spectrum find out about this burgeoning space. Has the popularity of ETFs, even though you were, let's say, an early pioneer and recognizing that has has that popularity surprised you to this extent that we're seeing now today it's amazing you know right now 6.5 trillion dollars just for an example at the end of the financial crisis there was only 600 billion dollars so it's gone up 10x since the end of the financial crisis which is mind-boggling however there's still 18 trillion dollars in mutual funds and you know you know the basic advantage is not only the diversification and the low cost that ETFs offer but the tax benefits compared to the active trading that goes on in the mutual fund area and and that's a, a big difference so higher fees not the tax efficiency that you have in ETFs and over time we'll eventually see ETFs take mutual funds over, especially if in one day you and I have the opportunity to buy ETFs in our 401k plans. Right. That really is the, I guess that would be the holy grail for ETFs, right? If, if you could, if you'd have that opportunity to have a selection within your employer provided 401k, for example. That's it. It doesn't seem like it's going to be happening anytime soon. But the good thing is the pressure that ETFs have put on the mutual fund industry most 401k plans have done a good job of offering up index-based mutual funds, and the overall costs of mutual funds have gone down considerably. So ETFs, in a de facto way, have done a lot of good things for defined benefit plans. What is it that is blocking that change? Uh, is, it, is it people trying to hold on to their business lines and their revenues primarily in terms of not wanting to give that revenue up? I think that's part of it. You look at Fidelity, 75 cents of every new dollar that goes into Fidelity mutual funds goes in via 401k plans. However, there are some accounting challenges. For example, in, in most cases, uh, fractional shares within a 401k plan isn't necessarily as easy these days. As we speak, Tom, it's the summer of 2021, because as we know, things reside uh, seemingly forever, we hope at least we think digitally. Um, and there's been this great theme over the last six months about the so-called democratization of markets. And when you talked about uh, some of those ideas that you identified early on, uh, the ETF piece seems very consistent with that. Uh, and that's you know, part of the conversation that seems to have begun this year with interest in, in GameStop and, and, and the like, the so-called meme stocks. Um, you know, there, there also can be a piece of all of that, though. I'm wondering what your thoughts are, uh, where, you know, sometimes people can get into things, but they don't necessarily take on the, the knowledge that they need to avoid shooting themselves in the foot, so to speak. So where do you draw the line with, with, between investor protection and access, access to markets and products? Yeah, and, and it's it's a great question. And you know, investors will always shoot themselves in the foot. It's part it's part of history, and they don't need ETFs to do that. They uh, they can buy meme stocks or they can buy stock options or anything like that. But to your point, we've seen an evolution in the ETF space where we've moved away from just traditional indexes like the S and P five hundred or the Nasdaq one hundred. Uh, now they're uh, different type of factor ETFs. There's sector ETFs. And now, as you kind of touched on, there are many thematic ETFs, many in, in, innovative technology, disruptive technologies. The folks, for example, over at ARC, we talk about Kathy Wood and the great things that they've done over, over time. It, it's a tremendous opportunity. Look, I kind of look at it this way. Coming out of the financial crisis, the S&P 500, really was tough to beat during that next 11 or 12 year period. And part of that was because there was a handful of stocks, FANG stocks, that had the majority of the gain. The big question is when you look at your portfolio today, if you have a 
high correlation of the S&P 500, will you invest in the next fang, group of FANG stocks? And a lot of people are saying no. So they're starting to diversify outside of those, which is a very good thing. And, that, and that's great for investors. However, there are some ETFs out there that are aggressive. There's, there's leverage two times, three times leverage. Eventually, we're going to see Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, the, the SEC has them waiting in line, wrapped around the corner in Washington, D.C., waiting for approval. Eventually, that'll happen. But with all that being said, most of the money is in the traditional, very low cost, pure beta, diversified index ETFs. And that's done very well for people over time. And let's say somebody really is looking at any kind of ETF, but within a certain category. And there may be, for lack of a better way of comparing, a Coca-Cola version of the S&P 500 and a Pepsi-Cola that tracks the S&P 500. What should people look at whether it's that kind of a category or another, to, to make the best decision for themselves. Yeah, and, and if you look at the S&P 500, for example, they're all different shapes and sizes. The tra traditional market cap weighted S&P 500, the biggest one is SPY, which is State Street Spider ETF. However, uh, Guggenheim has a equal weight S&P 500. Every 500 constituents in the S&P is equally weighted, a little bit different, and actually has done better over time. Uh, RSP is that ticker symbol. There's even an ETF that has a reverse cap weighted where the smallest company in S&P 500 actually has the biggest weight. So they're all different shapes and sizes. And, and we, we did this example with taking the most traditional index. So when you go out there and look at areas like emerging markets or um, ESG, for example, the issuers that are in this marketplace understand that this is a growing competitive space, and they're going to try to put their best foot forward, share their research, their ideas on why you might select them. This is one of the things that we try to do in education in the written form and also, also the statistical form with ETF trends and ETF database. And on top of that, Mark, we're very fortunate because we have tens of thousands of advisors that come to our websites regularly. And just by tracking the types of stories that they're reading, the types of ETFs that they're looking at or the lists, they actually give us some indication of what more they want and we give them more. And in doing so, we find what the current trends are before they actually develop and before most people are talking about them. So for example, commodities have been very popular with advisors a year ago, but it seems that just recently uh, we're talking about them more as inflation's starting to peak its head up a bit. Right, and uh, so th th that's this whole idea of trends it really feels like that should be your middle name. I guess it's sort of become your middle name at this point, right? Well, I'd like it because my middle name's Francis and I hate when people <laughs> call me Francis. Well, I, I don't remember any saints being named after a trend, but either way, <laughs> you're good. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. So obviously, as we speak, uh, inflation is, is one of the more hotly debated questions or themes in markets and, and whether it's the guess that uh, stays for only a short time or sticks around for longer than uh, just uh, a short time is, is the question of the day. Uh, Federal Reserve basically is telling us uh, there's not maybe that much to see here move along. What's your gut telling you and, and what are the advisors who are looking for uh, research uh, poking around and finding? Yeah, it's it's the hot topic of the day. And, and you're right there with your finger on the pulse in DC. Uh, frankly, most financial advisors don't believe it's transitory. They, they believe that uh, we are in a period where we're gonna have sustained inflation for an extended period of time. And uh, look, we could go through and we could talk about all the fundamentals, but uh, what's interesting is when you look at the flows that we've seen in commodity ETFs this year, it's actually flat. Part of that is because $8 billion has come out of the biggest gold ETF, GLD. 
In order for that to be flatlined, though, that means a lot of money went into other commodity-based ETFs that are more diversified in areas like energy, like agriculture, uh, like areas like base metals, for example. So these are all areas of the marketplace that they have real goods and real services that uh, are in very, very high demand. We've had disruption uh, delivery problems as well. So there's a big trend in place regarding commodities. And then talking to experts, even though gold was the least performing or worst performing commodity in the last year, Gold tends to be a second half player. So once things kick in and people really do believe that inflation is with us and we're not gonna see prices revert, more people will jump into gold because it really is one of those pillars. So I'm glad you asked it because uh, I think for many people and especially financial advisors that are responsible for people's money, they're starting to put a greater allocation into commodities because they believe it's with us for a while. And then could that weigh on stock market performance, leaving aside the negative aspects of inflation, but people are looking for something else outside traditional growth stocks, et cetera? Well, it, it's, it's a greater threat to fixed income because if we're going to have higher rates, it's devastating for the bond market. And we've had 30 years of declining interest rates. And if you were a 60 40 allocator both in stocks and bonds you did pretty well most of us can't remember how difficult it is during a rising rate environment uh, although a lot of people are talking about it they still don't believe it however we've seen only 20 percent of the money that went into fixed income etfs um, last year go in this year so there was more money going into fixed income etfs last year than went into equity etfs which is so surprising so people are on to it they understand they're looking for other areas for diversification and other areas for income and you can just see that by watching the etf flows well that's fascinating and i think that uh how this resolves itself is going to be uh sort of the thriller financial motion picture of the year, isn't it? It's, it's exciting because things have been in place the same way for an extended period of time. And when you talk about financial advisors, uh, there are a lot of people out there that are just managing their own money and they do a good job. But what happens was when financial advisors uh, are really there to hold your hand and to pr provide prudence during times of volatility, and that's the thing, Mark, we're going to continue to see areas of volatility, and it may not be in the stock market, it may be in the bond market in the next two to three years, and people won't be prepared for that. Yeah, don't you think that's sort of one of the uh, most misunderstood risks in markets is people uh, think that they can't lose money in fixed income or bonds? <laughs> oh, that's it. And there are a lot of folks like Jeremy Siegel that are saying, uh, 75-25 is going to be the new 60-40. We might see more people as we're living older, retiring, you know, at, at conventional ages, that we have more time to be able to go through the ups and downs of the equity markets when maybe for the first time in 30 years, we're going to see big challenges in the bond markets. Well, I appreciate bringing that point up, Tom, because it wasn't lost on me that when we conducted our bank rate market maven survey and I asked you, what's the one thing, uh, the, perhaps the big idea that people need to know right now, you went right to the heart of that saying, you know, what should that mix be? And so obviously you've been thinking a lot about this. And look, our job is not to guide investors or guide advisors, but merely listen to them look at what they're looking at, get some type of consensus and dig deeper into those areas that they're interested in. So alternative investing, especially in the income side has been hugely important. In, in the ETF area, there are companies like Nationwide that have these options overlay strategies that kick off almost 8% a year in income while you're actually benchmarked to the NASDAQ 100. Um, energy or MLPs, for example, that, yeah, they suffered a lot during uh, uh, COVID in, in first quarter of last year. However, also energy continues to look like it's going up while it's also kicking off an 8% yield. So I think we're going to continue to see opportunities that are outside 
conventional investing. And yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about fixed income and we can't do enough to educate people about the threat and rising interest rates. So Tom, you know, when we've seen equities perform so well seemingly for so many years, and we know, we know we've had a couple of bad episodes over the last, whatever, it's been 13 years or so, but those have been relatively short-lived. Uh, if, if things get more complicated, and, and likely they will somehow in the not too distant future, will we move away from this idea of democratization of investment and, and, and have it, the keys to the car handed back over to the professionals because it would take more sophistication? or how do you see that mix in the future? Well, I think the, the pendulum has started to swing from diversified, low-cost index allocation in the, in the form of ETFs that have done very, very well for an extended period of time, not to um, really active management from an individual standpoint, but active managers, folks like Kathy Wood, folks like Chris Davis, uh, that are in the ETF space and offer up their expertise specific to certain areas where you have active management within an ETF wrapper, but also have all the tax benefits of that, um, that that's also baked in. So I think we're going to see more conversations about active management in the ETF space as, as people move away from big traditional indexes and begin diversify into areas that uh, might provide a little bit more ballast for future volatility. Tom, if people want to get your newsletter, I know it's available uh, from the website. How do they get that? Yeah, just go to ETF Trends or ETF Database. You've got the ability to, to sign up and we'll give summaries of some of our best pieces that go out over the course of the week. And uh, we always love hearing from uh, investors. We love hearing from advisors. Uh, one Great thing that we're excited about is our first in-person conference uh, called Exchange. It's going to be in Miami in February of next year. We're probably going to have three or 4,000 folks there, a lot of financial advisors. If you're looking to get out and if you're an ETF nerd at all, we'd love to have you. So, Mark, hopefully you can make it. I'd love to. That's not far from where Bankrate was born in uh, the Palm Beach uh, neighborhood. So uh, it'd be great to see you and... and uh, find out more about what's going on in this exciting space. So as we get ready to tie things up here, Tom, what do you think, how do you think the industry may continue to be transformed, leaving aside, let's say the structural issues, the ability to uh, invest for retirement through an employer provided uh, vehicle? Where do you see this going? Well, I think the government just naturally has to be able to give more, in, in, uh, more options and easier options for uh, citizens because back to what we said earlier, uh, folks are living longer and we've, we have great technology and great medicine. I mean, the fact that you and I have a chance to live well into our nineties, retiring at 60 puts a little bit of a pressure on our portfolios, number one. And if growth prospects on the income side and on the equity side might be challenged over certain periods of time, that's a little bit difficult. I mean, I, I don't want to be having to go to Costco for a job when I'm 85 years old, but a lot of people are finding themselves in that position. So we have to be very uh, cognizant of, of uh, the fact that time can work for you. And we have to be um, aware of compounded growth and how that works for you, where you have tax efficient investing and low fees. ETFs offer that. Uh, I, I'm just encouraging people, especially as we talk about the threats on the fixed income side, if your uh, long-term outlook for at least 10 years out is positive, put a little bit more on the equity side and just diversify around the world. I think you'll do just fine. Well, I love that advice because it also, you know, one can almost make a joke out of it is the good news is you have a good chance of living a lot longer. The bad news is you may live longer and outlast your money. So, you know, uh, we don't want anybody to do that. Uh, but uh, Tom, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you and to hear about all the exciting things that you've been doing. Congratulations for your continued success. And thanks for helping us to help investors know just a little bit more about this important space. And we invite them to go to ETF Trends, the site that you founded and run all these many years. Thank you, Tom. 
Thank you, Mark. Really had a lot of fun. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.